Professor Harold Bloom, can you remember the first time you ever read? Oh, yes. I was uh, born 70 years ago in an all Yiddish speaking household in the old East Bronx. And I taught myself to read Yiddish when I was about three, Hebrew when I was about four, and English when I was about five. And uh, I read incessantly from the time I was three years old. In fact, I am a lifelong addict. Do you have any sense of why you started reading so young? I've spent years thinking about it on and off. I was the fifth child, much the youngest, the last, in a rather poor family. My father was a garment worker, my mother a housewife. He had been born in Odessa. She and the shtetl long since wiped out by the Nazis uh, near Brest-Litovsk. Um, nobody else in the family read. And I don't know, I didn't think I was a changeling or anything. I, I loved and was loved by my siblings and my parents, but I, something in me was very lonely. Something in me felt what I think is the deep pleasure that solitary reading only could bring. And so I began to read incessantly. There must be some genetic factor in this. I mean, eventually I tried to trace back, uh, you know, one could be of a proletarian family, ultimately of East European Jewish peasant stock, and still have Talmudists and Kabbalists uh, in the family tree. And indeed, when I looked, they were there. So I'm probably a throwback. If we saw you in your situation where you were the happiest reading, where would that be? At home in a huge old house in New Haven where my wife and I have lived for more than 40 years in a large Norse chair that I've worn out so many times I don't know whether this is the fourth or the fifth and I collapse my Falstaffian bulk into it and uh, usually with six or seven books and I I read through them with great gusto What's the longest you've ever s sat and read? In that chair? When I was younger, I could sit there for some time until my wife would rouse me out and say, this is bad for you. Go for at least a walk around the block or get on the exercise bike, which is what she says these days. Uh, sometimes when I'm writing a book, um, except for obvious needs, I, or being summoned to dinner, I, I stay in that chair or I move to the dining room table because I can't bear to write when I'm by myself. There's a huge study on the third floor and indeed the house has some 50,000 books in it. And there are two large offices at Yale, which between them must have 30,000 more and an apartment in New York with another 15,000. But I, I don't like to be where the books are. I like to be where my wife is or somebody else is, perhaps one of my sons. And I like to just uh, know that somebody is else there while I read and write. I mean, the activity is solitary reading and writing, but one doesn't want to be completely lonely. Do you ever read nonfiction? Oh, I read everything and anything. Uh, I'm a desperate reader. If I can't find anything else, my wife is likely to find me obsessively rereading serial box tops in the morning. And books flow in all the time, solicited and unsolicited, and manuscripts and proof copies and everything under the sun. Indeed, one of my jokes is that if some of my old friends with whom I attended the Bronx High School of Science and who are fierce believers in the humanoid future of computers, if indeed artificial intelligence so developed that the computers do develop personalities and creative abilities of their own. One of my favorite sad jokes is that I expect before I die to be bombarded by the epics and romances of artificial intelligence, though I don't expect them to be of very high quality. How long have you been at Yale? I got there as a graduate student in the autumn of 1950, so I've been there half a century. I've been full-time teaching on the faculty for 46 years now, and I have doubled as Berg Professor of English in the NYU Graduate School these last 13 years. How I, can I, you do both? I have a great deal of teaching energy, as I have a great deal of reading and writing energy. Otherwise, I'm a pretty tired old monster. How often do you go to the classroom. How many times do you teach a semester? I generally, five terms out of six at Yale, I give 
two seminars, usually one graduate and one undergraduate, but some terms both undergraduates. And I always teach Wednesday and Thursday from 1.30 to 3.30, but because I'm obsessive about getting to a classroom or anywhere else on time, I usually show up an hour and a half before the class and uh, tell the students, since I hate to sit in an office by myself, I, I shun my offices, except when I have to find a book, I, I tell the students to bring their lunch and we'll hold office hours there. What, what do you think this thing is about always wanting to be with other people? Well, I was never alone when I was a child. We were a family of seven crowded into four rooms, and they weren't large rooms. Um, and certainly before I got married, I was very solitary. Um, I don't know. I don't think it's the fear of mortality. I believe fiercely, as I say in the book you're holding, that one of the major reasons why we do read and should read is because we cannot possibly know enough people or know them closely enough. But I suppose, uh, I suppose, though I have been married uh, for 42 years and have known the lady for 44 years, and she is the best company there is, I, I suppose something in me is unappeased and peregrine, as Mr. Eliot says in one of his poems. Strange person for me to quote, as he's not one of my favorite uh, writers. I suppose my spirit is always somehow looking for something. But that's, that's, that's what being a reader is about, I would think. And that's what I am primarily. I mean, I'm a professional teacher. I'm a professional literary critic, uh, a very old-fashioned one. I now call myself at times partly in self-deprecation, but partly, I suppose, with a certain fury. Bloom Brontosaurus Bardolator, that is to say, not only a worshiper of Shakespeare, but a Brontosaurus, a dinosaur. I've never uh, learned how to type. I still write everything all day long with a black pinto rolling right a ballpoint pen on a clipboard that uh, an engineering student gave me as a gift back at Cornell in 1946 when I was a freshman and always on long yellow legal pads. So I am something of a dinosaur. I've stopped using the old library. I send research assistants there. I cried when they switched from the card catalog so many years ago to a computer because I can't handle a computer. And something in me, though I'm not a Luddite, resists learning. I just, I just don't want to do it. What are your students telling you when they come to class? And what are you seeing in the students that might have changed because of cyberspace? I think that the Yale students now, and I've known them for 46 years as students, I think they're intellectually at least uh, as gifted as they ever were. But there is a difference. Uh, all but the very most intensely literary among them simply have read a lot less, both on their own and in school, before they come to Yale than, say, 20 years ago. And I think that has something to do with the screen. I mean, as I remark at the beginning of this book, and as I so I, I, I try to avoid polemic in this book as much as possible, if only because I am weary of polemic, though my opponents don't seem to be, judging by the reviews of this book. Uh, I haven't read, but I've been told about. Uh, I don't want to read them. Um, there are two enemies of reading now uh, in the world, not just in the English-speaking world. One, and I think it's relatively minor, even though it's very annoying, and that has been the destruction, the lunatic destruction of literary studies, at least from my perspective, and its replacement by what is called cultural studies in all of the universities and colleges in the English-speaking world. And everyone knows what that phenomenon is. I mean, the, the now weary phrase, political correctness,